Well, we were uh, well. You were enjoying college basketball and Super Wild Card Weekend. Connor was in Athens, Georgia, celebrating. Well, I don't know if he was doing the celebrating or if he was just kind of watching the celebrating uh, from Georgia's national championship. Connor, appreciate you coming on today. How are you? Watching the celebration, not celebrating with the Georgia fans. I'm an unbiased journalist through and through, but I, I will say, you know, maybe this isn't a fair comp, but. I had never experienced a, a championship parade of any sort. I, I didn't even go when the Cubs won it all in 2016. But as a lifelong Cubs fan, there are just so many so many similarities between these two these two organizations, and kind of seeing the way that their fan bases have reacted. And it's been it's been pretty cool to be able to to see and, and, and know a lot of Georgia fans who are just soaking in every possible second of this because this is the type of thing that like, it just doesn't happen that often in college football and finally did this year for a fan base who was very much ready for it. Yeah, I mean, I can understand what you mean about the, the comparison from the Cubs because the Cubs mm-hmm. went all those years without a... 108 and 41. It's a little Didn't different. <laughs> couldn't even get to the World Series, but there are other similarities here. I mean, they played in the same division with the Cardinals, the most yeah. successful team in the National League. You know, and, and so since that 1980 season, Georgia saw Florida, Alabama, LSU, Auburn win national champions. Tennessee won one. Tennessee as well. I mean, <laughs> so you can understand where they're coming from in this case. So it was all just nothing but happiness. And I guess they've already started to build Kirby's statue, right? Yeah, of course. And look, I'll push back on any notion that the Cardinals are somehow Alabama because I know their fan base is, uh, their fan base thinks that they're the best <laughs> fans in sports, but they are indeed not. Um, that's my unbiased opinion on that. I look. I, now I think you that, sound like a fan, Connor. Now you sound like a fan. <laughs> not this unbiased journalist. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely not. Uh, definitely not an unbiased journalist when it comes to that. But yeah, I mean, there's something to be said for that for being kind of reminded every single year. Oh, you're not on that level. Or even if you do think you are on that level, something's going to happen to you that, that's going to prevent you from being able to, to reach the top of the college football mountain. And Saturday kind of felt like the last day of innocence that this Georgia program is going to get to have because, as we often do, is is turn the page. And we say, all right, what's what's this program capable of moving forward? Should we expect the national championship to run through Athens every single year, much like it has through Tuscaloosa, that, that's a fair question to ask because now that Georgia has been able to get over the hump, beat Nick Saban in that process, you now look at Georgia and say there is nothing really that that should be standing in their way anymore of being able to do this or at least compete for this on a yearly basis. And I think that's what Georgia fans have already transitioned to. So, I mean, outside of Alabama, the recent national champions from the SEC, Auburn and LSU, fell apart within two years after that national championship. Alabama's kept it going, but there's there's no reason at all to believe that Georgia follows Auburn and LSU. Not like we would have thought that those programs would melt away and the coaches would be fired less than two seasons into it. But, I mean, this this Georgia program is a completely different situation than that, and they're much more like Alabama. Yeah, Kirby's 46. I mean, that's it. Like, all these other active coaches who won a ring, even including Dabo, they were older than 46 when they won their first title. So that's the thing that I kind of look at, and I'm like, man, this is – I, I don't know what gets in the way of Georgia being super relevant for the next decade or so. And, and look – that there's no guarantee that championships happen, but even if I, you want to really get into the weeds, and die, hey, could could an NCAA scandal blow up Georgia? Hmm. <laughs> we're in the NIL era now, and we're getting closer and closer, I think, to the pay-for-play era. So even if you wanted to be a cynic and look at it like that, you would say, well, you know, I, I think Georgia's going to be all right there. And you have a coach who has that Nick Saban mindset, uh, the guy who, Kirby Smart, who, will chew out his starting quarterback for not being able to get to the line of scrimmage close to, quick enough to be able to try and get a last second field goal when you're up 27 to three in a playoff semifinal. Like mm-hmm. that, that's who Kirby smart is. So yeah, I mean, sky's the limit right now. Yeah, and if Connor, if Georgia is able to somewhat be the Alabama, the East and that the road to the CFP goes through Athens, you know, when you make that Alabama com- comparison in the West, while Alabama has been truly, truly dominant, 
there has been that Auburn thorn in their side. Auburn has had one has had some really good seasons throughout there. Has beaten uh, Alabama. Has taken it away from them a few times in, in this Nick Saban era. Who's going to be that? Thorn in Georgia's side that trips them up every now and then. Is it Josh Heupel at Tennessee? Mark Stoops at Kentucky? Heck, is it Beamer with South Carolina? Does the East have somebody that can truly be a, an Auburn-sized thorn in Georgia? Uh, short term, no. I, I don't think that's the case. And, and look, I, I love what Shane Beamer did year one in Columbia. I, I love that Tennessee is so much more entertaining to watch than it has been at any point really in the post former era with, with the way that they actually are able to score and have these chunk plays. But I, and I, I, I really like the hire of Billy Napier. I, I think there's a possibility we look back four or five years from now and look at this coaching cycle and say, did Florida actually have the best hire? But those are all long-term things. Georgia is so heads and shoulders above the rest of the league right now, and that's why I was able to dominate in such convincing fashion in the regular season, why nobody was really close to them. I mean, this is Georgia's division to win until further notice, and I, I think that long-term you could see a scenario in which, all right, maybe they go back and forth with Florida a little bit. Tennessee can occasionally trip them up with the way that they play offense. They still have a lot of questions on the defensive side of the ball and their future there, but I still think that this is about what George is going to be able to do against the bigger and better opponents and what it's going to look like. Can they replicate what Clemson did in the latter part of the 2010s? And can they have something kind of similar to that where it's like, all right, just pencil Georgia in. They're getting to Atlanta every single year. And then we'll kind of wait and see what happens after mm-hmm. that. And, and you bring up Clemson. And I know we've got nine months to the start of the season, plenty of Mondays to debate and talk about this, but Having the down year for Dabo Sweeney and uh, DJU uh, under center, you know, right now, if if you had to say yes or no, Clemson bounce back next year and is in the CFP, yes or no? I'd say yes, and I, I'm and I actually just wrote about this the other day about why this juncture is really going to determine if Dabo is kind of you know an all time great coach. I think he's definitely one of the, one of the best coaches. Coach number two, probably, of the 21st century, maybe number three. You can make an argument that Urban, with his his mm-hmm. record in conference play, could, could kind of skew that a little bit. But whatever the case, I, I'm fascinated by this juncture because Dabo is all of a sudden Will Smith and the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. He's looking around. It's an empty room. And he's like, <laughs> wow, I got my D.C. gone. I got my primary play call the last seven years gone. I've got my A.D. gone. Everybody's gone. And I, I still think that they're going to be able to – bounce back because I think a young offensive line is going to get a lot better. They didn't really get much out of the quarterback position this year. They still won 10 games. And I think that the ACC is really, really wide open. So if I had to guess, I would say that Clemson is going to be able to bounce back and they're going to be able to find more answers than they were in the first part of this season. So this new uh, Clemson athletic director handpicked by Dabo because, I mean, he's in that position on campus there where he can kind of, you know, run the whole athletic department. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Dabo was the one doing the interviewing. If Tato sat down and basically was like, all right, are you going to give me my slide? Are you going to make sure that I get a 10-year contract every time I get to a national championship? Can can you make sure that Clemson stays as Clemson and, and unique as possible? Can you do all those things for me? And then, you know, that was probably what the vetting process looked like more so than like the university president sitting down because, yeah, Dabble runs the show in Clemson. Absolutely, man. I mean, it's like, so they tell you as a head coach, the biggest decisions you make are who you hire as your assistants. What about after you've won a couple of natties and you get a chance to hire the athletic director? Is that (laughs) just as big? Um, CFP expansion. You tweeted earlier today, and I I guess I knew this, but I had to kind of rack my brain to remember only six programs have won a playoff game since the college football playoff was instituted. Bama, Georgia, Ohio State, Oregon, Clemson, LSU. That's it. So what do we got to do to get expansion going here? Because it doesn't seem the commissioners can even agree what to eat for lunch. <laughs> uh, desperate times call for desperate measures. That, that would suggest that one of these conferences, is uh, the ACC, is going to have to get desperate. I mean, maybe it's another year of Clemson being left out of the field or the ACC altogether being left out because this was the first time that they had been left out of the college football playoff. Maybe that's what it would take in order for this to happen. But, yeah, I mean, it is so regionalized now. I mean, think about it. Four of the six teams who can claim that they won a playoff game, they came from the southeast region of the country. 
one of those teams, Oregon, that was seven years ago. Mm. Right? That, that was a long time ago. And then Ohio State's the other one. Like, that's it. So, yeah, we can sit here and say that it's all about, you know, being able to kind of compete in November and to have playoff chances. But this is about trying to get other regions of the country some sort of playoff success and trying to have a system that allows for that. And now everybody's kind of looking at Greg Sankey to be like, hey, you need to do something for the good of the sport. And he's willing to do that. But he's not also going to go for an 18 playoff that has six automatic qualifiers when that makes no sense. We have 20 years of data to show us that not all conferences are created equal. The SEC is heads and shoulders above everyone else. The SEC doesn't need expansion. These other conferences do, and they're sitting there you know, debating and, and squabbling over silly things when all of them need expansion to have a chance at ending what the SEC has been able to build. Mm-hmm. And, and Connor's biggest news, you know, f- f- around the Arkansas program the last few weeks, and Arkansas got some good news with and throughout the transfer portal, got a couple more five stars, including the uh, linebacker Drew Sanders uh, from Alabama. And what you've seen Sam Pittman do through the portal, through recruiting, you know, through winning nine games, going nine and four in year two, going into year three. Where would he rank as far as coaches in the in the SEC West? I mean, is he clear cut number three, or do you have him even? You know, still needs a lot more to prove to to get on the level of a of a Lane Kiffin or Mike Leach. Gosh, it's a fascinating question. I probably can't quite put him ahead of those two guys just because of how long they've been doing it. Recency bias would say that Arkansas mm-hmm. deserves to be considered better, but. Man, it's probably, and he's not going to be, you know, Sam Pittman is not on the level that Brian Kelly is. Like, Brian Kelly, look at his track record, and he has more wins at, at this level than, than most people realize. But, I mean, you would probably put him probably somewhere in that five range or so, mm-hmm. and you would say, all right, he's he's still, he's climbing. And he's going to show up on these weight, like these, these top 25 coaches in the sport like he's going to start showing up on these lists and he deserves to in my opinion but yeah you got to feel feel really good about the direction that he's been able to go in i know they've lost a good amount of talent via the transfer portal but they're also bringing in a good amount of talent i like the drew sanders edition somebody who would have been playing if not for dallas turner emerging into a stud for alabama and now uh, alabama's loss is arkansas's gain so yeah i would definitely put him in in that realm and especially if he can continue to kind of work the transfer portal to his advantage Bet Online would like to wish you a happy new betting year as we continue our march to the playoffs and beyond. Bet Online remains the number one spot for all the best sports wagering action for 2022. New year and a new updated desktop and mobile wagering to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code BELIEVE to get started. That's B L E A V. From football, basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts.